Hey everybody, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 445. Today, I'm joined by guest Mr. Josh Blum, and we're talking about the classic martial arts film, Ong Bak. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I've been a passionate martial artist all my life, and now it is my job. And that's what we're doing here at Whistlekick. We're putting in work. We do a lot of different things. And if you head to whistlekick.com, you'll see all the things that we've got going on. There's a store there with some products that we make, things that I have personally designed. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that's going to get you 15% off every single thing in the store. If you want to know more about this show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find out a ton of stuff there. We do the show for you twice a week, and it's all in support of you, the traditional martial artist. And our goal here on Martial Arts Radio is to connect and educate traditional martial artists. It was exactly 20 episodes ago that we brought you the first collaboration between Martial Arts Radio and the 13th Hour Podcast. Guest Mr. Josh Blum came on and we chatted about 36 Chambers of Shaolin. And here we are, we're back again, and we're talking about another classic film, Ong Bak, the debut of Tony Ja. Well, maybe not technically the debut, but the first time pretty much anyone outside of Thailand had seen him. It's an impressive movie. It's a powerful movie. And we get, we get into it. So instead of repeating what you're about to hear, I'll just get out of the way and let you listen. So hey there, everybody. Here I am. I probably talked to you in the intro, but maybe you're, you're getting a different version of the intro and you're not entirely sure what's going on with my voice leading us in. I'm Jeremy Lesniak and I'm here with Josh Bloom. And we're going to talk about Ong Bak. Yeah. Yeah, and this was your idea. You know, we were talking about what movie we were going to talk about next, and and you suggested Ong Bak, which I was embarrassed to say I hadn't actually watched. Well, it's a uh, um, it, it's a good one. I mean, it's a it's a, even so this came out two thousand three. I mean, you know, we're talking you know more than a decade and a half later, but I mean, it, it's a good one. If you're going to watch, like, I think I'd come up with or I'd looked at. Um, you know, top martial arts films of all time somewhere. I Googled it or something like that. And this was, this was a film that was on that list. And I would have to agree that uh, it definitely has some high points. So I don't think you can go wrong with it. No, no. And I think it definitely deserves a place on that, on that list. You know, uh, last time we talked, we talked about uh, 36 Chambers. Yeah. And what I found interesting as I was watching Ong Bak was just kind of comparing and contrasting because, you know, you kind of have a, a a couple different, you can, you can make a split in movies that you think of as martial arts movies. You've got big budget and low budget, and you can probably split them up in a lot of different ways. But I tend to watch the big budget stuff. I haven't seen a lot of the lower budget stuff. Uh, it's just, yeah. I don't have a lot of time. And, and I figure I've got, if I'm going to watch a movie, I'm going to shoot for something that I know has a better chance of being enjoyable, not just for the martial arts, but across the board. As an actual movie. Yeah. 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 And, you know, something like 36 Chambers was fun and I enjoyed it. And, and, you know, if you like that movie and you haven't heard our discussion on that, I we have it still up. I'm assuming your episode of it is still up somewhere on your page, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, can, you can check it out. So you can go back. You can listen to our conversation on that. But one of my criticisms of that movie, and I think this is what I'll, I'll lead off with on Ong Bak, is that in 36 Chambers, it took me some time to get into it. And mm-hmm. It was like a third of the movie in uh, before I found myself actually caring about what was going on. And yet with this film, very early on, for reasons that I honestly cannot explain, I found myself really into it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it has something to do with, you know, one of the opening scenes um, is, is this very weird, um, almost kind of... Uh, surreal um uh type of intro where it has all these people and if you haven't seen this film i'll try to describe it uh all these people um and they're sort of like covered in mud and they're climbing this huge tree and you can figure out pretty fast that the idea it's like a free-for-all and the idea is to get to the top and it's almost like a capture the flag kind of thing um but uh the the characters are basically climbing this tree fighting with each other knocking each other off into the ground and uh, we don't actually meet our hero um, the character played by Tony Jaa uh, right away. He's the one that sort of prevails through the whole thing, but it's just a really, really weird opening. 
I had no idea what was going on when the first time I saw that. I was like, what? Is this the same film that I get? <laughs> Did I get the wrong thing? That tree scene, maybe that was the thing that made it a little more uh, compelling from the get-go because you're watching and yeah, you have no idea what's going on. And I yeah. think that that's intentional. And you start watching and you're seeing these people fall out of a tree from fairly high heights. Right. And you're yeah. watching them and it's clear that this is not some battle for anything of real significance. And once I figured out that these people were likely friends or, or you know, somehow engaged socially, but yet they were beating each other out of trees, it was clear that whatever was going on was pretty important. And I was just flinching at the way they were falling down and hitting branches and everything. Right. The fact that, that, that uh, at least a couple of those falls probably would have not killed somebody, but, you know, landed them in the hospital or, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Like, wow. So, so this is, you know, it's, it's violent right from the, basically the first, first scene. Um, and uh, I think that probably sets, <laughs> sets the stage for the, for the movie as a whole. Yeah, I think it's a good point. It's a pretty good anecdote. You've got violence, uh, maybe a creative approach to presenting that violence, and a plot with people that you're kind of caring about, flinching at, uh, despite having no idea what's going on. Right. And I, I will say, I remember when this movie came out, um, uh, a group of friends and I uh, had uh, heard about it, um, uh, this was pre YouTube. Uh, this was probably 2001 or 2002 and someone had found a trailer somewhere. And I remember watching that trailer over and over again because they stuck in so many stunts in there, um, that were, uh, you know, you can, you can find the full thing in the movie, but, um, we were heavily into, you know, martial arts tricks and stuff like that at the time. And it was, uh, that, that whole scene and community had just sort of like, it had been around for a couple of years. And so here was like, I don't, I don't know if like the free running and parkour kind of thing was entire, I think it was sort of coming around the same time. And so there was so much of that in this particular film. I remember us really looking forward to it. Um, and uh, so the, I don't think the trailer was even in English. Um, it doesn't, but it didn't really matter. So I remember uh, having uh, really uh, uh, sort of high hopes for the, the film when I finally got my hands on it. Mm. Yeah, one of the things that I'm I'm going to look up right now as we're talking, I don't remember um, it, what the budget was because that tells us a lot about whether or not it was destined for uh, for international release. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, it it grossed twenty million globally. Yeah, and and a qu and a quarter of that was in the U.S. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, it's not popping up. Yeah, I got the impression that, or maybe I read this somewhere, that the film was actually created um, or written specifically for, for the, 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 the lead, Tony Jaa. Um, but I, I could be misquoting that, but uh, I, I got the impression that it was something like that. Um, I think uh, at the time, you know, obviously there was like Jet Li and Jackie Chan, um, uh, though Jackie uh, Chan was, you know, he's, he was, I think he was at right around that time, he started transitioning more to, um, less of the super crazy stuff. And I think he would occasionally use wires here and there um, uh, just because of age. Um, I, I think about the same time. I, th I think that was also true of Jet Li uh, around that time too. So um, I, I think the, the world was kind of like looking for somebody else that was, could kind of pass on the mantle. Mm. So I, I don't know if that my, that's my recollection of it. It could be entirely uh, apocryphal, but I don't know if that seems right to you. No, it does. It does. It's it's a good point. You know, you start seeing like movies like Rush Hour that somehow are defined as martial arts movies. If you if you look up box office results, even though they're not what most of us would consider to be a true martial arts film, where the martial arts is the driver of the story. You know, it's right. the, it's not a symptom of the story. Right. right. Or, or whereas this film, uh, you know, there's I mean, so the, the plot, um, <laughs> such that it is, is, is sort of a throwaway kind of thing. It's like, it's really almost like a, it kind of reminds me of a video game where you have like wave after wave of like guys for like the main character to beat up. And, you know, the plot is that, uh, you know, um, uh, 
the, the main character, I think his name is Tim. Tim. Tim in, in, the, in the movie. He, he comes from this village that's um, a tiny little village uh, somewhere in the you know, countryside, Thailand. And it, there's a drought. The village is not doing well. And they have this like protector, like this statue called Ong Bak. And there's a guy from the village who, who has since become a, like a criminal element and left for the big city um, and comes back to basically steal this thing. Um, I, I'm, I was never entirely clear, clear exactly why, but um, he steals this, the head of this idol. And so the idea is that now, now, they're, now the village is screwed and that they're going to they're gonna starve. And so they need someone to go and rescue the head. Um, and so it's basically like uh, a bare bones kind of plot for, you know, uh, for a journey, like a hero's journey kind of thing, you know, where the hero uh, doesn't have a whole lot of resources happens to be like you know kick-ass uh, fighter we don't really we see a little bit of his training but not a whole lot and it very quickly launches him into this like uh, fast-paced adventure in the city yeah and he's he's leaving his village with the you know the love and the support of everyone around and and you know they're giving him the the little bit of money that they have and he hops on this jeep and drives away and and as you said, we don't know much about his training. The little bit that we know is that his instructor has told him, you know, don't fight. Right, right. It's, uh, uh, if anything, it seemed like he was maybe training to be a monk. That's the impression I got. Or, yeah. Uh, or, yeah. Yeah, the idea was that, you know, at least in this village, this statue of Ong Bak is, is kind of, you know, it's revered. It's their, you know, I hesitate to say it's their god, but there's, there's a cultural worship happening collectively of this statue and there are people who become monks in service to this very simple temple and this statue and they pray to it in festivals and and you know my sense from the the tr opening scene with the tree was that the person who grabbed that flag got to do something as part of this festival and, and this whole uh mesh of, yeah of you know festival holiday kind of deal sure and it and it kind of seemed like uh the um th there were uh i think two characters from the movie that had left that village because uh, you can kind of see like if you didn't want to be a farmer uh you didn't want to be a monk i mean there probably wouldn't be a whole lot for you there um and two characters had left one of which is the the is like the i forget his name but um uh, he has a mustache, uh, sort of wiry guy, and he's the yeah, he's the one of the bad guys. Um, and then then there's uh, another character which um, uh, which uh, the main character goes and finds in the city, and he's sort of like um, you know sort of a, a prodigal son, I guess, of the village who's uh, who's left and you know maybe had some intention of coming back but never did, and probably doesn't send any money either. Um, and he's going to go to the city, find this guy, and hopefully this guy will help him, you know, uh, get the statue back. Right. Right. Yeah. His name was uh, Homle. Homle. Yeah, that's like that. right. Homle, yeah. And you kind of got the sense that uh, um, the, you know, the villagers had a different conception about what Homle was doing in the city. Um, so Homle is like sort of like a, a minor criminal or like a kind of a hustler. Um, you know, hard shark and just really just hustling to get by, um, not living like lavish lifestyle or anything like that. Um, but he, uh, it doesn't want to return back to the village either. I mean, whatever, however lousy his life is in the city, uh, however dangerous, he, it seems like he still prefers it to the, what, what was, what was there for him in the village, which I think was to become a monk and he didn't want to do that. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think hustler, but I also got the sense he was a bit of a gambling addict and yeah, degenerate. Right. Right. And maybe an alcoholic as well. I don't, I don't, I don't remember that exactly, but you kind of get the sense that as soon as he made money, he did not hold on to it. Right. And we see that a couple of times through the film. Yeah. I think there was a, I think with the first time you see him, I think he, I don't know if he loses or he's the manager for like a bike race, like a motorbike race kind of thing, or, I can't remember if he loses or he, he's, but he's on the losing end of it, I think. And he asks for some money, whatever his share to be paid. And uh, I think he ends up 
I think part of the deal was he was going to be, he was selling them like pills, you know, like prescription pills or something like that. And they were like doctored pills, like they were fake. And so uh, he ends up on the losing end of that transaction where they find out that the pills he's trying to sell them are fake. And so he's like, you know, he's trying to cheat, he's trying to treat other, uh, like cheat other criminals. And, and, and uh, so basically gets, you know, his, his, uh, his ass handed to him. And then the, um, he has a, a sidekick, a young woman who I think, I don't know, was a girlfriend or sister or something like that. Hard to say. Uh, yeah, it's a little ambiguous, and I think intentionally so. Yeah, yeah, I got the sense that it was it was like a someone that he wasn't really romantically involved with. It was sort of it's sort of like a partner, but he he was kind of like a big brother style of, uh, or more was like a parental kind of figure to that to to this to this woman. I think her name is Moy, Moy or something like that in in the film, um, and uh, um, so. Uh, so the, the the main character Tony John meets these two characters, and they're sort of bumbling, like you know, uh, low level criminals. When he first gets to the city, and this yeah. is his introduction to yeah, yeah, and and you know, of course, it's a martial arts film, so we're looking for when is when is the fight going to happen, and you know, he ends up at that underground, you know, fight ring. I don't even, I don't even think that first one had a ring. Yeah, that was just kind of like you know a basement kind of a deal, and he's just he's Tony Jaw, you know, and and there's no there there's seemingly no transition for him from don't fight, don't fight to just putting these guys down. I right. mean, it's, it he doesn't seem to have a struggle with that, which I thought was odd, and I would right. have expected that to be part of the plot line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, character, uh, the, I think the supporting characters are actually a lot better developed than the main character, because you actually get a sense, like, of um, the uh, Humley character and, and then the, uh, some of the villains. You actually get a little bit more sense about kind of who they are as people. The main character, like, his motivation is actually to get this head back to his, back to his, um, his village. I mean, that seems to be his motivation. You don't really get a sense, like, of aside from that, like what else he has, like what, you know, why does that mean so much to him? And uh, like, what exactly would happen if he failed that? And, right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, was, it seems like a sort of a throwaway plot vehicle for him to, you know, to bust some heads, which he does on numerous occasions with his elbows. But uh, <laughs> yeah, and that's, I think that's the thing that I find most striking about this movie is the fighting style. Yeah. Now, I, I don't, I haven't trained in Muay Thai. I've trained with some people who've trained Muay Thai. I have no idea how accurate what he's doing is traditionally. I'd read something somewhere along the line that some of his training, if not personally, but for the movie, was actually an older style called Muay Baran. Yeah, sure. Uh, You know, I didn't didn't dig real deep on that to find how accurate that was. But a lot of what he's doing looks very classical. Yeah. And in those opening scenes where we see him doing that little bit of training that you mentioned, right? that doesn't look like it's fight-based. It reminds me more of, you know, someone doing a Kung Fu form. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I, I think the, the part where he's doing, you know, in the beginning of a Muay Thai match, they do like a little dance. It's probably the right term for it. But... And so I think he wanted to inject some of that in there, but I, I got the sense and I'm same with you. I haven't, I've done some bare bones of like Muay Thai uh, training, but, but not certainly not in a traditional sense. And uh, so I got the sense that what he was doing was just highly stylized that uh, especially the the jumping spinning kicks and everything like that and that he threw in there that that seemed like more of a um especially like the flying elbows i don't know i lost track of how many times he jumps up <laughs> in the air and elbows somebody in the top of the head yeah yeah and and you know somehow of- each time or nearly each time that movement was not blockable right like, there was nothing they could do any other move that he would throw there was a good shot they would block it or or counter or get out of the way but if he jumped up and completely exposed his torso to come down on the top of their head with an elbow, 
that was like a Mortal Kombat level finishing move. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a certain element of that, which is like highly stylized and obviously probably kind of impractical. But um, I think what he, what he was trying to go for is like, and I, I, like, I don't know this for sure, but I got the sense that it, this was like a, a chance to show the world. And I got the sense that it really was, they were aiming for like a bigger audience than just Thailand. Like this is Thailand. This is like, cause there's like a, a slight element of like a, a Thai kind of national, maybe not nationalism is the right word, but sort of patriotism. Like in those underground fights, like I think you fight somebody from uh, um, the UK. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's like a big, huge guy who, who makes some jabs at like, you know, uh, people from Thailand are small and you need Thai boxing, you know, but, but look at me, I'm big and I can, you know, uh, I, I don't need that kind of thing. And then there was uh, another guy who was wearing like a, um, who looked like he was doing either Kung Fu or karate or something like that. He was wearing like the, uh, like a Chinese, um, um, uh, uh, uniform, Kung Fu uniform. And so you, you get the sense that there was a little bit of like uh, country versus country kind of thing here. And that, um, there's a couple scenes where he makes a point to wrap his hands, like in the traditional mm. um, kind of way with the, with the cords and everything like that um, uh, to show that this is like my, this is my ancestry, you know, and I'm going to be stay faithful to that. And my entire knowledge of that with the wrapping of the hands goes back to the movie kickboxer. <laughs> well, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, where, where apparently they, they would, if they were being really extreme, dip those wraps in wax and then crushed glass uh, and fight yeah. with each other as Jean-Claude Van Damme taught us. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Well, so who knows, you know, there, but he, he uses that like a couple times. Uh, I think there is one time where he's, he's, he's again thrown into a ring and he's, you know, he's going to wrap his hands kind of like that. And then at the end he's wrapping his hands because he has an injury. So I, I got the sense that there was, there was like a, it's kind of like this go Thailand kind of aspect of it. Mm. This is, this is our, like our own guy. Right. And this is a Thai movie. We're going to show like what, what, uh, um, that, that Thai boxing can, can compete with any of these other things. Um, at least in a, in a film kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. And of course the movie quickly shifts from, you know, these, this organized fight to, you know, tying everything together, trying to find, the severed head of Ong Bak and the associations that these two petty criminals that he meets. Right. And, and yeah. the chaos that ensues there. And there's a lot of running around and what I would have to say is extremely well done, well shot, creative choreography through the streets of, I, mean, I don't know if, it, do we know if it's, if it's Bangkok? I, I think it was supposed to be. Um, I don't know if it really was, but th I remember that sequence. So the, there's a, a part where he's being chased. And I think the movie has a couple great chases. Once uh, the, the one that we're talking about right now is on foot, where basically the Tony Jaa character is being chased by a bunch, again, a bunch of like, you know, crooks who are, who felt cheated by um, his, uh, his uh, um, compatriots and they're chasing him. This is like a very simple kind of thing. And he goes running through marketplaces flipping, dodging, sliding, um, all kinds of things. I remember that was one of the scenes that was in the trailer. I'm going to watch that thing over and over again yeah. where he like does an, does an aerial cartwheel in between two sheets of glass and he does a split sliding underneath like a, a, a semi, semi, uh, yeah, the truck. Trailer. Yeah. And he does like, um, uh, <laughs> a double, he, 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 uh, there's a bunch of tires and he does like a double front flip, uh, <laughs> um, off of those tires landing on his feet um like a standing full full uh full twist coming off of a bend. i mean there's all kinds of stuff that uh he does um that i i, I don't want to say they're commonplace now but you see at the time i think you just didn't see that many people doing that level of athleticism right um and for all of us who were like into all the tricking and everything like that uh it was like oh my god this is great this is awesome uh, you know, it's like, so I, I had done gymnastics and stuff when I was in high school. And so, um, kind of carried that forward when I found out that there was like, a mm. um, there was a way to combine martial arts with that. And, uh, and it was up to this point, uh, aside from random clips of people doing it 
on the internet because uh, there was no YouTube then. There wasn't really like a huge, it wasn't like on a widespread kind of thing. I don't remember seeing a movie where they did as many of those kind of techniques as they did in this one. No, no, I, I agree. And what I found interesting in most fight scenes, if the star, if anybody's doing anything impressive, I, I was always struck by it taking me out of the movie. It, right. it seemed like it was added in. It was, oh, what cool thing can we plug in here? Right. Yeah. And while I'm not going to pretend that someone sliding via a side split under a truck is necessary. <laughs> right. Right. None of this is necessary. Right? It's not, none of it's necessary. But there was still, you know, kind of in the same way that I found myself caring about the characters early on, despite what was happening, a lot of this felt less egregious, less obnoxious mm -hmm. than it is in other movies. And again, I'm not quite sure why that is. Maybe because Tony Jaw is so skilled at doing what he's doing, or maybe because in a sense it fits. You know, what we get through that first chase scene, fight scene, is that he's trying to get away as efficiently as possible. And okay, here are two panes of glass. I'm just going to you know, side flip through them because it's faster than going around them because I'm that good at doing it because I'm Tony Jaw. Right. And, you know, it, it's, it is even more egregious because they slow-mo, like they, they do it and then they actually show the slow motion, like re replay of it again after, after he's done it to add extra impact to it. And for some reason that did not feel annoying when, mm -hmm. when they did that, at least uh, when I was watching it. Um, maybe it's because... I don't know. And maybe it was just because that was that what they were just trying to do is showcase like, you know, this is a cool stunt that we're doing. Um, and I think that, you know, like Jackie Chan has probably done that too. Um, but uh, the, the, I guess the, the sort of sheer variety, I don't know how long that, that chase took to do. I imagine it probably must've taken mm. months to, to it, film that, but yeah, um, there was a lot there, you know, it was, it's just like a, a really action packed, like couple minutes there. And you can, you know, if you haven't seen the film, you have no idea what we're talking about. It, you can probably find that that particular scene on YouTube. It's worth watching just for like the sheer athleticism of, of the whole thing. There's like a one part where, um, uh, and, and they they try to inject a little bit of comedy into it too. So he is, um, which I appreciated. Yeah, like the uh, um, the Humley character who's not as athletic, but it manages to keep up. Um, uh, Tony Jaa jumps through. It looked like honestly a roll, like a a circular roll of barbed wire or something like that. Mm. He jumps through it basically in like a pike position, his feet are straight out in front and he's curled over his feet. Um, and then he gets through it without any problems. And then the Humley character j tries to jump through it again and ends up like, you know, uh, getting stuck in a barrel or something like that. So there, there was like some, <laughs> some attempts where they tried to make it, you know, kind of humorous. He um, did do a pretty good job of, of providing the comic relief, you know, later on the scene with the knives, I found yeah. to be pretty entertaining. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's the magic. Maybe that's what is impressive about this movie is that you get some good choreography, but it's balanced out by some humor in a way that we typically see in Jackie Chan films. I think that was probably a huge influence. Um, and the other thing, I, you know, uh, is in a lot of the Jackie Chan films, the Jet Li and stuff like that, the, the shot is far enough away that you can actually see the action happening. And, and it stays on the uh, on the on the on the people who are actually in the shot. In other words, it doesn't it doesn't it's not cut up. Like I think this was around the time where they started to um, shoot from multiple different angles and kind of mash them all together in a way that you couldn't actually see the action happening continuously. It would it would go from one one angle to the next to the next. And I don't know if that's because they were trying to use camera tricks to to make it look um, better than it actually was, but they don't need that in this film. It's just a far away. It's panned out and you just watch the whole action happen as it, as it, as it did, except for the instant replays. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think for the fight scenes as they are, I mean that I've always kind of, I've always kind of find that those quick cuts where they're, they're changing it a little bit kind of, it's kind of annoying. I guess it makes it easier to choreograph. I, I don't know, but, um, uh, it, it, I feel like that sort of thing takes you out of the, the experience a lot more than if they just let it let the let the actors do their thing 
well, it gives more license to do things that you don't have the the actors don't have the skill to actually do, yeah. and it allows them to swap in stunt doubles without yeah. us realizing it as as much. I I'm gonna guess that Tony Jaw didn't have a stunt double for anything in this film. Yeah. I didn't look that up, but I I mean his face is visible in in everything from what I recall. Yeah, I read he didn't. Um, so I don't I don't know if the, how accurate that is, but I mean, but uh, I think is is he was following the lead of like Jackie Chan, who I think for the most part is not used for stunt doubles. Right. Uh, still does if that's still the case anymore. But at the time, you know, when this whatever this was filmed, you know, early two thousands, I think that was still the case where he was doing his own stunts. Um, so yeah, I mean that's a really tough. Uh, uh, sort of bar to to live up to uh and I, I don't even know like this is one of those things that if this film were made in this country or the or the budget were higher i wonder how much they would allow the lead to do some of the things that they did there was one scene where his pants are on fire <laughs> yeah. do you remember that scene where yeah. for whatever reason he's an explosion and then he jumps out and he does like a, i don't know whatever 900 whatever i ever how many revolutions uh, and kick some guy while his, while his, his whole lower body is on fire. And I read that he actually got burned uh, during <laughs> the process because they had to do it multiple different times. Mm. The flames, I think, actually burned his arms or other parts of his upper body. And he's not wearing any, like, protective stuff um, on, on his arm. Just, they're bare. So I, I imagine that that probably wouldn't have flown had that been done in this country. Right. Right. Um, but I could see something like that happening uh, where uh, like in those, those uh, 70s or early 80s Hong Kong films or, or this where, hey, you know, they're, 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 they're sort of, um, the, the movie is basically a vehicle for the main character and uh, that lead actor. And they're not so much concerned with, well, what happens if he breaks his leg and what happens if he gets, you know, <laughs> their degree burns or whatever. I mean, they're just kind of hoping that doesn't happen, I guess. Well, at the time, he wasn't a star, so he was a yeah. he was a calculated risk. You know, if they if if they lost him, and, you know, I I hate to say that, but I suspect that that was part of it. You know, this yeah. is a probably a pretty low budget movie. I'm going to guess, you know, yeah, two to five million, yeah, and yeah, if they get one one movie out of him, then so be it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um. The uh, so I guess that that the, some of the other scenes where uh, there's one other chase scene that uh, comes to mind that's also again I don't know how how long it took for them to do this but if you look at some of the chase scenes and they're they're probably influenced by uh, I'm sure uh, plenty of other Western movies you know like I, I don't know like uh, for, for some reason the the police car scene in, in Animal or not Animal House uh, is it Animal House no the Blues Brothers comes in oh comes yeah. <laughs> Um, or other scenes like that, but I was also thinking of like you know like Terminator Two or some big budget kind of stuff where there's like a highway and um, uh, it's a, a chase scene where there's a, a lot of destruction. But they're they're using like a Thai staple like um, those little tuk tuk um, three wheeled vehicles, a little like uh, uh, almost like tricycle style of um, uh, um, motorcycle with yeah, uh, with, but with little, the roof with the roof on the back, yeah, that you see in like Thailand and Indians. It, it, it's uh, they reminded me if a if a like a small moped if a moped and a horse drawn carriage yes <laughs> had a baby right right yeah um and it was it was very creatively done where they were um chasing each other uh it had it had a uh this is going to sound bad and it's not meant like a, it's going to sound like a sort of a uh um uh, a dollar general version of like, you know, like a chase scene from like, you know, Terminator 2 and like big vehicles and stuff like that. It had a very, but it had a very like in-country kind of like feel for it where they're not using like, they're not using cars. Uh, they're not using trucks. They're not using airplanes. They're using the local form of, of transportation. I guess they could have used bicycles or whatever, but this was faster. And so um, there's that particular scene where they're, uh, chasing each other and fighting on top of these things yeah. um, was, I, I think, lent it a unique flavor. It was fun. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that's a recurring theme through the film is that they were probably limited. They were probably hamstrung a bit by the budget, 
but instead of making cheesy attempts to stretch the budget, they said, well, what can we do? And let's make the best of that. Right. Yeah. And that's what we end up with. And I think that that is the magic here. You've got a, a character, you know, an actor who was unknown before this film. And let's face it, probably without this film would not have had the opportunities that he had. I mean, I, Tony Jaw is pretty amazing. I suspect he would have gone on to greatness at some point. But yeah. I don't think you can deny that this film catapulted him. And if you look at that entire philosophy, I guess, through the film, it's making the most with very little and it works yeah and that's that's one of those things that i uh, kind of enjoy watching you know how other countries do this um and, and even aside from movies like when you see somebody um you know training in another country i mean especially like you know a country that's less developed than say like the u.s or the other places in the western world i mean and they're they're um they're doing so much with very little um, and you realize how little do you, you know, how little do you actually need um, to, to actually uh, um, uh, to get good at something. And um, here, here was somebody who I think, so I was reading a little bit of his bio. I think he had actually trained specifically in a number of different arts as well as like gymnastics and wushu and things like that. So he already had a fair amount of concentrated training. Um, but uh, I mean, the um, if you, if you aside from say him, if you look at uh, some of the people, some of the Thai boxers and stuff like that, they come out of Thailand. I mean, the training is very regimented and stuff like that. But I mean, I think a lot of the conditions that these guys are training in are are pretty like uh, they're they're quite different from like you know say a posh gym or whatever like uh, in the U.S. So I don't know, just kind of like an interesting kind of kind of. Uh, Thing that you don't necessarily need a lot uh, to um, be able to get good at something. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and then, I mean, we can, we can talk about the end, I guess, yeah, because it, there's, it's, there's, there's one it's thing pretty I, dramatic and interesting and, and left me scratching my head in a few places. Yeah. There's one thing I did. I, well, when we're leading up to that, that I, it was, I don't know if it was an attempt at cheese, but it, before the Tony Jaw character leaves his village, He's given this thing that kind of looks like a, a blunt or something like that. And oh, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is like special medicine. You know, don't use this, save this for when you really need it. Like, it's really like a video game. Like, this is your like power up or like one up or whatever. If, you, if you're dying, like use this. And, you know, which he uses at the very end, you know. And I kind of wondered like, so what is this secret, you know, uh, 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 country Thai medicine? You know, is it, is it? You know, is it is it something they ground up, or is it you know just is it like heroin or PCP or something like that that just you know going to dull dull the pain, you know? Um, and so he uses it at the very end uh, to counter some other you know the the other uh, one of the other guys who like uh, seems impervious to pain. But I thought that was a funny scene where they uh, maybe unintentionally funny where they because um, that's what was running through my head as they give him this. I, I'm going to guess if it was supposed to be anything authentic, it was Kratom. Oh, interesting. Um, which if, if you, I mean, we could, we could take a hard left and talk about Kratom, but I, I don't think it's a, a good yeah. use of our time as we, as we do a movie yeah. review. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, huh. but <laughs> yeah, to, to counter the effects of what I'm assuming was, was some kind of amphetamine in what five syringes yeah, that he, jams that he injected heart. directly into his heart. <laughs> right. right. I mean, I'm watching that, and and the only thing going through my mind is he is now prepared for his last battle. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter if you win or lose; you're you're not going to make it through this one. Right. Yeah. You know, as a as a slight detour to this this film, the the only thing I I thought that because you know I think in general like the flow and everything was really good. Um, there's a there's um a, like obviously there's a lot of violence, so there's that, but. There's, they definitely injected a fair amount of seediness into the film. I'm not sure it needed it um, because I don't know if, uh, I mean, that's, I think that's, that's a stereotype that people I think have of Thailand, you know, sex and drugs and that kind of thing. I don't know if you needed that to, to um, have sympathy for the characters and to know that the bad guys were bad, but there is a fair amount of that. Um, so there's a, so kids, if you're listening, there is some uh, wanton drug use in this film. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a modern city 
gritty movie. And 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 I don't know that it was needed, but I think it would have been odd if it wasn't portrayed. Right. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of I don't know if you've seen the movie Showdown in Little Tokyo. I have um, Brandon Lee and Dolph Lundgren, and it's it's it, almost that kind of film where it's like a it's portraying like a, an element of society that's uh, you know not the best, and um, so they stick in a fair amount of uh, R-rated stuff in there. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I let's... guess. Go the, ahead. Uh, yeah. So uh, you so so about the end. Yeah. Let's let's talk about what he stumbles on, and you know, I have to admit there must have been some symbolism there between them working on removing the head of this very large Buddha statue and the beginning with removing the head of the Ang Bak statue. But I didn't get what the symbolism was trying to say. I didn't either. I mean, <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not the only one then. Yeah, I didn't. You know, again, this like the, some of the the way the plot kind of hung together. It, I, you know, I don't know. Like maybe part of it, I you know, maybe is lost in translation or something like that. Um, the copy that I was using, like uh, the audio and the subtitles, were a little bit off sync. So like, I don't. I may have missed a few things. But the uh, um, in in the chase scene. Uh, actually, at, with the little tuk tucks, one of them goes into the water, um, carrying one of the one of the henchmen, and then Tony Ja. And then while he's coming, he's you know trying to save himself in the water. He's, he's, he's coming to the surface. He discovers all of these artifacts, you know, that are sort of suspended underwater. Mm. Oh, wave. right. Yeah, I did, didn't miss that important. And, um, and, and so the, the the main bad guy was has been like uh, sort of pillaging like national treasures and i guess maybe trying to sell them right i don't I exactly know what he wanted it for like why did he and, he and then they show him the main so the bad guy is 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 it a wheelchair he talks through a uh, uh one of those little um things that people use if they have a, a tracheotomy and he actually shows him smoking through that hole in his throat um, which yeah which was, was yeah. just gross yeah I, again i don't know if they needed that but you know just, I, I, I don't i don't like gross i don't watch horror movies because of the gross <laughs> that generally comes with them. Uh, that was one of those moments. I think maybe even the only moment in this movie where I averted my eyes. Cause like, yeah. I don't need to someone see someone smoking from their tracheotomy. Yeah. Right. So cool. it just kind of like show like, uh, you know, how much of like, a um, it's almost like the antithesis of the main character, right? This guy who can't even walk, you know, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, um, is is physically unable to do the things the main character does, you know, including like talk, um, and is still like smoking through his his trait. But anyway, whatever. The um, but he's 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 in addition to pillaging artifacts and hiding them underwater, he there's this like cave that, where there's a huge Buddha. I assume it's a Buddha, or I'm not really sure. Um, that he's trying to remove the head from. Again, not really sure why he's doing that or what the purpose of that would be for. But he wants it. So. I'm assuming it's for its sale. I mean, I know that, you know, antiquities, you know, there's a black market for that. Sure. Why they would still have value being just the head and not the entire statue. I mean, in the case of the one at the end, it's massive and challenging enough to, you know, move just the head. I mean, we see what happens when the head falls off onto somebody. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, what went through my head uh, was that, okay, so you're going to take this thing. Exactly how are you going to get it out of the mouth of the cave? Is, is it big enough to do that? And what are you going to do? How are you going to move it? But anyway, well, that, that's beside the point. But um, So he's, he's, he's a bad guy. He's stealing like national treasures. Um, and he's got a bunch of people protecting him, one of which is this guy who's seemed like he was a pretty good fighter in his own right, but then uses, uh, uh, how should we say, um, you know, uh, chemical means to enhance himself, including sticking like a whole bunch of syringes in his heart. To, yeah. Uh, to pain. Yeah. Which it was just, it was kind of ridiculous, but that, you know, to the, to the credit of the choreographer, when I saw that happen, you know, and the two get up and they're about to fight, I was expecting your very typical end of the movie boss fight scene that goes on way too long. And the hero is beaten within an inch of his life and somehow finds the strength to persevere. Right. And it wasn't every, that. Every, like every Rocky movie. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it wasn't that. It was yeah. far more balanced and far shorter than right. I would have guessed. 
Yeah. Um, you know, the hero does uh, emerge with a lot of, you know, cuts and bruises and, you know, uh, bumps along the way. Um, but yeah, it, it, it definitely, uh, it definitely wasn't as drawn out as it could have been. Um, so those two characters, the, the main, um, sort of the, the main, like the second in command guy who, who sticks the syringes in his heart, um, he, they had fought once before. Um, and so you got a preview of it, I guess. Um, and it was quite as, uh, it was as, uh, as, as brutal as you might expect. Although in the, in the second confrontation, you know, our, our, our hero has the benefit of, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is Kratom or, or some other kind of substance that, <laughs> where he's, he's also slightly impervious to pain. And, uh, Kratom is not that magical. No, it's, it's, but, it's an interesting, it's an interesting substance, but it's not, yeah. it's not nearly magical. Yeah. Um, so whatever it was, you know. He, uh, he becomes impervious to pain, and so that's uh, <laughs> there, there's this uh, this part where uh, he's just getting kicked, and he kind of just shrugs it off, you know. Um, and uh, they make use of the. Uh, I, I think that that was a nice uh, kind of use of a, a couple different things where um, they they show elements of the like the tie boxing that um, unless you watch it closely, like. You can lose it amid, amidst all the uh, the stylized like jumping and spinning and that kind of thing. Where um, you can see him like going for the legs, like going for the insides of the thighs. Mm. Um, you can see him uh, them fighting with their elbows um, close in. And and you know they didn't have to stick that in. Um, I think because uh, they could probably get by with like the the bigger and flashier moves. But I thought that it was nice that they did to keep it kind of true to the the um, the feel, like the overall what they were trying to convey you know right. his particular style right absolutely absolutely and then you know of course it ends in the warm fuzzy sort of way he gets the head and goes back and all is well yeah. right <laughs> there is a sequel um on two of them yes yes right right on Bach two at least two of them i, I I'm, a, I'm aware of two of them yeah yeah, which don't have. So I, I remember watching the sequel uh, when it came out. I haven't seen the third one. Uh, the se I don't know if um, if you know anything about it, but the sequel is very weird. <laughs> it's one of those ones where um, it's it's like a spiritual sequel. It's not really a uh, it's not a direct thing. We never find we, we don't see anything more of this particular character or his village or anything like that. But we see um, it's like a precursor, like several hundred years before, um, and they had a lot more money with that one. But uh, the plot got, I couldn't follow the plot. It was very convoluted. So it's like one of those ones I kind of would like to rewatch. Maybe I'll rewatch it at some point and see if it makes any more sense. Because I think the second and third one kind of go together as one. Mm. But if well, you were only to see one, I think this would be the one to see. What I find interesting uh, is that Tony Ja was one of the directors and the writers for that second one. Oh, interesting. Okay. And... Yeah, I, I think, I suspect that, yeah, well, um, the numbers are all over the place here, um, whereas the first one did 20 million, this one did nine globally, yeah. uh, domestic gross here in the U.S. was $100,000, you know, it, it was, it, it tanked. Yeah. Uh, but I suspect that if you're interested in following Tony Jaw's career, digging into the second movie and how he got from, you know, star to the second movie and directing and writing and being involved on that level is probably fascinating, but mm -hmm. a little bit beyond, you know, what we would go into on here. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, I don't exactly remember when, um, I don't know if you, uh, there's, there's probably numerous people who have influenced, been influenced by this particular period, maybe this movie. Um, but I know for for everybody who uh, did like martial arts tricks and stuff like that, like for example, you had like uh, Juji Mufu on on your show before. Yeah. Like everyone, sort of of that era, um, they could identify with so many things in this particular film. There was just like more and more motivation to go out and try those things. And now, if you and now the sort of the level that people have gotten to is so is so incredible. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it maybe would have happened there anyway. And I don't know how much this film necessarily helped that, but um, it certainly didn't hurt. Right. And if 
you were at all a, a fan of Into the Badlands, you saw a lot of this style of movement. That certainly the cinematography was dramatically different, sure. but this style of choreography happened constantly. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, yeah, I don't know when the actor you know you, you know Scott Adkins. Hmm. Yeah. He's a um, he's a British guy. Uh, he's been in a bunch of stuff, um, but a very uh, acrobatic um, kind of guy. Uh, I forget which style he does. I think it's maybe karate or something like that. But um, um, a good, very good martial artist in his own right. But his uh, has had a career um, that's fairly similar, but uh, um, maybe a couple of years later. Um, where he is also very acrobatic. Um, it's been a lot of, uh, been a lot of films. Um, I think there's one with, there's a couple with uh, John Claude Van Damme. He, he did a film, I think, I think it was just entitled Ninja. Um, and there may have been a second one um, where he was the lead. It was one of his earlier roles. He was the, uh, there's, a, there's a series of movies inside a prison. He did um, do the Ninja films, yeah. Yeah, where he's this, he's this Russian guy. Um, Yuri, I think it's Yuri Boyka. Oh, the Boyka movies, yeah. yeah those are, which yeah, are a couple of great. those. Um, uh, and they're all really pretty low. They're probably fairly low budget. Some of them are direct to video, but he's a very similar kind of performer. Um, you know, great, uh, great acrobatic ability. And I would, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, obviously, but I would imagine that uh, um, he was probably influenced by. If not necessarily by this movie, but by um, people who were doing this kind of stuff at that time. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's. I bet we could pinpoint Ong Bak as a moment in time where the choreography moved forward. You know, we talk about martial arts and it progressing and growing, and you know, looking at what martial artists do today versus even ten, twenty years ago. Sure. What's happening on film? is continuing to escalate. You go back to the sixties and seventies and see what was being done on film. And it's, you know, it's very simple. It's very basic. And not to say that those movies aren't great and that there aren't aspects to them that I enjoy. Yeah. But you could not get away in 2019 doing not only that kind of choreography, but something from the nineties. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so it'd be interesting, I guess one of the things that I'm most kind of interested with is like, so as these, as these folks get older, right, um, I think we've seen this with like Jackie Chan, with Jet Li, it's like they have to, they can't keep this level of physicality up forever, right, your body just won't, right, just, just will not tolerate that, you know, as you're, well, maybe some people can in their 40s and 50s, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how old he was at this movie, but he looks fairly young, and I imagine... Uh... He was born in 76, so in, so in 03, he would have been... He's like, well, actually, so he's in his, yeah. he's in his you know, mid-20s, um, which is probably, like, you know, probably at his peak. Um, although I have to say, like, I saw a, a clip of him. You can go, like, on his, I think it was like his Facebook or something like that, where it shows a training session um, for him doing a lot of the same kind of moves, I guess, for, you know, probably training for another movie where he looks just about as good. And that was in 2014. So that's just a couple of years ago. So um, I guess it, you know, it's, it's really impressive, you know, to maintain that level of uh, ability that long, but at some point, like you won't be able to do that and to, to see how their movies kind of evolve, you know, um, over time, do they become more story driven? And, um, do, do they focus more on character development? And uh, I think you're starting to see that like with Jackie Chan and stuff like that. Mm, for sure. Which I think, you know, I think we've, we've talked about this before, like a martial arts movie is like, you're not really watching it for the movie. You know, there's like, I can, I can only think of like maybe one movie where it's like, I actually enjoy the movie just for the movie. And it's like probably like Big Trouble in Little China or something like that. Maybe not even a true martial arts movie. You, you watch a martial arts movie for like a very specific thing, you know? And uh, so it's kind of, in a way, it kind of, helps broaden the genre, you know, when there's maybe a little bit of martial arts, but then there's actually a well-crafted story behind that as a character development. And stuff like that. Right. Right. Yeah. And which it's risky. 
I have yeah. to imagine it's risky to to spend all that time doing that and knowing that people are going to fast forward it. And we could, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding making the direct allusion to something else that people say the same thing about, but uh, I think the implication is probably clear. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, any last words? No, I, it was, it was a good movie. I'm glad I watched it. If, if anybody out there has not seen it, uh, it's definitely worth the time, especially since it's where we get to meet Tony job. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, um, if we've made it sound weird in some way, just know it's a, it's also a fun movie. I think it, that's a good word for it. You know, the, the action is good. The movie is fun. And there are points, I mean, as you said, it, it can be weird and you don't always know what's going on, right, but right. you don't mind. Yeah. You're so. kind of along for the ride. You know, it's one yeah. of those things where you, you really don't have to think very hard. You can check your brain, <laughs> uh, turn it off for a little while and just appreciate what's going on on the screen. And there's, you know, that there's a place for that as well. It's kind of like the equivalent of like a pulp store novel or something like that. And that's to some degree, like that's, um, there's a, there's definitely a, a place for that sort of thing. You know, the, you know, you take for a sure. Chance, you know, break from your day. Yeah. So, uh, that's, uh, that's Ong Bak. Um, I don't know, Jeremy, what's, uh, we, I think we, one of the things we wanted to do was find a movie that neither of us have seen, um, and then try to, try to review that, which, uh, which may be still a good, uh, Thing to do I'm, I'm happy to do this again if, if you're absolutely right. yeah absolutely this i'll keep i'll keep looking you know it's it's good for me because you're you're good at this you are you're you're doing a better job at taking notes and remembering things than i am so it's forcing me to step my game up which i appreciate oh well um yeah i i, I wish i could u- utilize those those uh those skills for uh <laughs> for, for more useful things than <laughs> maybe i should have been a m- movie critic or something in another life or Viewer, but uh, maybe but, uh, well hey i mean if you want to if you want to review movies for marshall journal yeah oh, always yeah. picking people yeah, yeah yeah um but yeah jeremy it's been so much fun you know doing this and uh yeah. i i am glad that uh you see that we agreed on this one because like i said i haven't seen this one in a long time so the last time i saw it was probably you know shortly after it came out i'm not really sure why but it is what it is but yeah you know it'll be fun it may maybe in the future maybe in the future we do a we could experiment with a, a live viewing party. You know, we pick something on Netflix oh, yeah. and kind of count it down and watch as an event. Oh yeah. Um, I've speculated that that would not be well attended, but the people that would be involved would greatly enjoy it. Yeah. Sort of commentary. Yeah. yeah as it kind of happens. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's, that's an interesting idea. I don't know how you would do that with, with uh with because you can do that with audio yeah okay something to think about but. well i was imagining you know uh two screens you know watching it on on one screen and then having facebook open on the other sure and, yeah. and doing it that way yeah that would be a fun thing well so um i i think you 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 have a bigger audience but uh if anybody who's who's interested in that sort of thing uh would be uh uh open to to participating or think that would be interesting you know just let us know totally totally so, um you know check jeremy out whistlekick.com anything else you want to plug um whistlekick.com whistlekick martial arts radio.com i mean you start at whistlekick.com you find everything yeah you know you can find this podcast um you know in addition to on jeremy's show um on my website one three thhr.wordpress.com you know, and numerous other podcasting platforms, you know, iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and that kind of thing. So uh, if you have any questions or uh, comments, you know, um, you know, leave a comment or question there. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully people are listening to both shows. They better be. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and the other thing, you'll see a link in the show notes, at least for mine, I'll, I'll try to stick a show note uh, link to um, our previous collaboration with the yeah. members of Shelton. So if yeah. you haven't seen that movie, that's another one to uh, maybe a, a worth, a, worth, a, worth a watch less listen. So. Totally. Cool. All right, man. 
It's Thanks a, so much. a pleasure. Thanks so much. There are far more martial arts films than I'm ever going to be able to watch. And as much as I enjoy them, maybe in different ways, depending on the film, I just don't have time. And so that's why I appreciate Mr. Blum reaching out and saying, hey, here are a handful of films that you might appreciate. You know, with 36 Chambers, with Ong Bak, I'm watching movies that are classic, but I haven't had the push that I needed to check them out. So I want to thank Josh for the push and the encouragement and joining me today. I had a lot of fun and, and I want you all to stay tuned. There's some stuff we're talking about that might take this whole thing a little bit further. Fingers crossed. Head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes for this episode, for all of the other episodes, sign up for the newsletter, and really just get in on everything going on. If you want to know more about the show, go to Facebook, search for Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio behind the scenes. There's a private group. We'll let you in. Unless you seem really sketchy. (laughs) We'll probably let you in. We let almost everybody in. And that's where we have announcements and behind the scenes and sometimes some good conversation. So check that out. If you go to whistlekick.com, that's where you're going to see everything that we do. Blog, links to other projects, the entirety of what Whistlekick is online. And if you buy something in the store, use the code PODCAST15. That gets you 15% off. You can also see a lot of what we do at Amazon. If you want to help us out, there are a handful of ways you can do that. You can make a purchase. You can share an episode. You can like us on social media. You can leave us a review. Anything that seems like it would be helpful to us would be really appreciated. Helps us keep the company going. Keep the lights on. If you have suggestions for future topics or guests, there's a form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com that you can fill out. Let us know who you think I should talk to or what topic should we unpack. Our social media is pretty simple. It's at whistlekick everywhere you can imagine. My email is jeremy at whistlekick.com. We keep it easy. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.